Um, yes, I. Um, California is a, a huge overwintering a place for monarch butterflies. Um, I actually have one place that's probably about 30 minutes from me, but our speaker today is a ranger at one of the largest overwintering spots um, in the state uh, near Pismo Beach. And um, she's gonna tell us a little bit about how the butterflies get there, um, the life of the butterfly, and um, how we can help um, ultimately save or um, save butterflies because the, pop the monarch butterfly population has, in California itself, has gone down quite a bit. But I believe it's probably across the United States that the um, population has gone down. So um, Michelle is going to be able to uh, tell us a lot of those things today, hopefully. I see and, that she's on here. Um, and before so. she starts, I'm going to uh, do some introductions. Thank okay. you. Thank you uh, for telling us how you found her. But I found that quite interesting. Uh, and Michelle, before you start, we have a master of ceremonies who is going to be uh, with us in a few moments. But since we just have a couple of minutes, would you please raise your electronic hand if you are a national officer in another organization? So I'm going to start with Jolie Potts. Jolie, would everyone unmute for just one moment, please? All right, Jolie, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jolie Potts, and I am the second vice president general of the National Huguenot Society. Thank you very much. Cynthia Bixby, I see your hands on. I'm Cynthia Bixby. I'm the president national of descendants of early first responders. Thank you. Or Jane Johnson. Hi, in addition to being the corresponding secretary national for the uh, National Society Descendants of American Farmers, I'm also the second vice president national of the United States Daughters of 1812. Thank you, OJ, congratulations. Mary Jean Hall. I'm the uh, state secretary for the Colonial Dame 17th century in Arkansas. Thank you so much. Bridget Everts. I am the corresponding secretary of Colonial Daughters, Cl Colonial Daughters 17th century. Thank you so National much. National position. Thank you. And the SDP. Thank you. Thank yes, you. I'm the uh, treasurer for the Dutch, Dutch Colonial Society and also the treasurer for the Order of the First Families of Maine. Thank you, Sandy. Deb Sheely. You're muted, ma'am. Yes. Yes, I am the counselor national for the National Society Descendants of American Farmers. Thank you, ma'am. Do mm -hmm. I have any other hands up? I see no other hands up. So I'm going to take this time <clears throat> to introduce our esteemed Glenn Martin. Glenn is our Toastmaster. He, uh, he makes us shine. And he is also our MC for many of our events. So Glenn, may I please let you introduce our speaker? She is here now. And you are muted, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, I'm apparently a little late. I had another meeting, no, so. No, sir, you're just um, fine. No, hope sir. everyone is doing well. No, you're fine, thank you. Okay, I want to, uh, I want to thank uh, Bev Sheely for my amazing Zoom background. I appreciate it very much, Bev. I'm glad that I get to show it off. Is she here? I mean, thank oh, yeah, you. There she thank, is. thank you. Yes, Bev. thank you. You're more than welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. It's beautiful. It is gorgeous. So, Michelle, with uh, with everybody being on, oh my goodness, they're still coming in. So if you would please just like to take over, Michelle, and I have made you, Michelle, I have made you co-host. Great, thank you. And I, I just had to switch tripods really fast. My other one broke, of course, right as I was setting up to, to meet you guys. <laughs> We're all good though. Um, let me just kick that broken piece to the side. Here we go. Well, um, 
um, yeah, so my name is Michelle, and I work here for California State Parks, as you can see by my uniform, um, here in the beautiful Ocean of Dunes District. Um, so I have some really cool photos um, just to give you a glimpse of my state park district, but raise your virtual hand, I guess I should say, um, if you've been to, if you are familiar or have been to my area, just so I get a feel of of my audience. A few, okay. Very cool. Um, so yeah, I am in California. Um, my position, my title is interpreter, um, but that's just a fancy word for education. So I'm in the education department. My job is to be out here in the public. I lead um, tours all over our, our district. Um, I go into classrooms and teach. For summer, I get the privilege of doing junior ranger and camp five programs in um, both of our uh, state park campgrounds within my district. So it's a blast. Um, but today, being with you all, first of all, just hearing some of your titles when you're a few of you introduced yourself. Um, so cool. Lots of lots of history. Um, I feel honored to speak with you guys this morning, um, and it's a treat in. In a couple ways, um, I'm used to doing this program in the winter time because as we'll get to learn, um, our monarchs migrate down to us and we only see them in the winter. So first of all, this is like Christmas in July for me, monarchs in July, um, because they're one of my favorite things to teach on. Um, and that is because they are still sort of a mystery in certain aspects of their life that we'll learn. Um, and I like that. I like that there's still some mystery in the world. I think it's really important to pause um, and find time to be in awe of things. I think um, the world is so fast paced. So yeah. <laughs> hope today we can pause and be in awe of the monarch story. Um, they are an insect. So maybe a few of you have joined us being like, oh, I want to learn about them. That's cool. But um, they are a fascinating insect. Um, and like I already said, there are certain things about their life cycle and their migration that scientists just don't understand. And, and that's why I love it. That's why I love teaching on them. Um, but like I mentioned, let me give you a little idea of where I'm standing. So I am inside Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. Um, as I was being introduced, I did hear or some talk um, before I started that this is one of the largest groves currently in California. It wasn't always that way. Um, I'll probably touch on. Um, so it's special being here. We have a lot of scientists come to study the monarchs here, um, especially when it gets a little too, um, a little too dangerous to study the large overwintering sites in Mexico. Um, scientists will come here to study. So it's, it's just extra special. So let me pull up some photos. And before, or as I'm pulling up these photos, um, I will say there is a lot of content um, to teach on with these butterflies. So if I'm ever talking too fast <laughs> or I know there's going to just be an influx of information, I will pause and um, check for questions and then absolutely uh, end with questions at the, when I'm through with this as well. So um, write down your questions. If you're like me, you tend to forget things. Okay. Oh, you know what? Not just this, I might do a little poll on what states I'm speaking to. Okay. So monarch butterflies, Oceana Dunes District. Here is California. Um, sometimes, so I'm, we're on the central coast of California. It's such a beautiful area. If you ever get the chance to come visit, please do so. It's just, I feel honored to live here. I grew up in Morro Bay, um, which is just north of here. So I'm local and yeah, it's just a great spot. So I always, I tell visitors that we're, we're pretty much equidistant between LA and, um, San Francisco. So there's that blue dot there. We'll zoom in a little bit closer. Um, here is, this shows, let me pull out my little marker. We have Avila Beach up here, which is beautiful. And then as we come down, we get into Pismo 
And as we get in here, um, we have Oceano Grover and those big old sand dunes that we're known for here. Um, so yeah, at Oceano Dunes, we have these massive sand dunes. Um, part of this district is Oceano Dunes SVRA. And SVRA stands for State Vehicular Recreation Area. We are the only beach in California where you can drive on. Um, so this is our actually our Pismo Dune Preserve. There's no, no driving out here, um, but it's a great place to walk. This photo is very deceiving. Those sand dunes are very tall um, and it gets very hot out there. It's almost like a desert. So um, when I'm walking around out there for work, um, yeah, it's very tiring. <laughs> But here is, here's the driving aspect of our sand dunes. Um, it's very fun. It's, it's a thrill. So as working for state parks and as state parks, um, we are here to preserve our natural and cultural resources alongside of upholding outstanding recreation. So for our park, the recreation for us um, is ATV driving, uh, razors, side-by-side -side sand rails, now this, um, this year we are able to use our scientific drone to take some photos of our grove. Um, in a second, I'll do a little 360 um, view of exactly where I'm standing. I'm right in, inside our grove. But this is a view at the tops of our eucalyptus trees here in the grove. We'll talk about these trees um, and what makes this area perfect for our monarch butterflies. But peeking up on the top of these trees, we can see the Pacific Ocean. So we are so close to the beach right here. I can smell the sea air. Um, and that's also important to, to our monarchs, um, really enjoying this little nook of the Central Coast. Let me stop sharing. Um, I forgot to also mention, you might hear my radio go off. I have to listen sometimes. I'm also right by a highway. So if you hear a motorcycle came on just before I started talking. Um, so I apologize if you can't hear me for a second. Um, yeah, I, I didn't mention, I wanted to say that unofficially I am a descendant of an American farmer. Um, my dad's side of the family, they're farmers. Uh, he grew up farming wheat. So I forgot to say that. So I feel sort of, I feel connected with you all as part yes, of this. Group. You are very um, good. Yeah, I forgot to say that. I think that was very important. Um, yeah, so let me just give you a little tour of where I'm standing and then we'll just dive on in. I think it's important to show um, my location. I'll also lower the tripod a little bit. Okay, let me flip our screen. Okay, and this, I mean, this is a public area so you'll see visitors walking around too. Um, Sometimes I get questions while I'm while I'm presenting. Uh, let me try to swing this around a little bit. Okay, yeah, that's not working. So um, it's a small grove. So when I say it's one of the largest, um, that just goes to show you how many overwintering sites um, and land we've lost due to certain factors. We'll get to. Um, this is where we teach our, our kids. Typically, I'm speaking to second graders. So um, another treat for me this morning is, is uh, giving a tour to adults. It's always fun. So again, off season, but during the year or during the winter months, um, there'd be monarchs flying around. A grove is mainly eucalyptus, which are non-native. Um, another, the other species of tree we have here are our native species, um, the Monterey Cypress. There we got, that's our, um, our merchandise trailer over there. So this is our center, a little center island, um, and the path just goes around the center island, and that is it, that is it. So that gives you a glimpse of where I'm at. Any questions before I, I dive into the migration and the life cycle. Let's see, should we use the Q&A? Does that work best? Okay. That's fine. That's fine with us. Hi. Hi. You want to ask you to raise their electronic hand for questions? Oh, raise it. Oh, okay. We can, yeah. Okay, we'll start with Patricia. 
Chris Everts, you have your hand raised. Okay, it's going to Sandy. Sandy SD, your okay. hand's raised. Mistake. Okay. No, I think that was the left <laughs> one before. So right. Donna Cohen, your hand is raised. When you go through your program, would you go through how the lay the eggs are laid and what they look like and how it progresses? Because many people think that it's an insect uh, or their plants are being infected, so they'll wash those eggs off. So if you could go over that, because I think that's very important. Yes, we're doing the we're doing the whole life cycle. Don't okay, worry. Okay, good. Yeah. Any other Anyone questions? Else? It does not appear to have. Oh yes, Vicki Carmichael has a question, please. Um, what I'm most curious to learn about, just FYI, is the monarchs that you get. Are they the same monarchs I get in Florida? Great question. We're going to cover that. Absolutely. And if I don't touch it on it well enough, raise your hand again, and I'll I'll get to it. Like I mentioned, there is. These are very complex insects, and so. Um, and I love them, but there's always information I leave out and it's different information each time I give the program. So questions at the end, just jog my memory to, um, to um, get through everything. So perfect. Okay, let's jump in. We are going to start with their migration um, and why they come here, why they like this. Um, Cause that's a big question. Okay. Great. Okay, story behind the grove. Um, their migration. It's difficult to study. Uh, we can't put trackers on these guys. Um, they're so lightweight. Holding one penny in your hand, that's the weight of five monarch butterflies. So um, I feel like technology could soon advance enough for us to have a lightweight enough like GPI, uh, GPS um, to put on these. But so far, scientists, they um, tag them with stickers. Um, they put them on, here, let me show you. They put them on this wing cell right here. It's called the discal cell. Um, it is their center of gravity. So placing a sticker right there um, does not affect their flying. It's, they're good to go. So, um, but those stickers are limiting. They'll have a phone number on them or maybe a, a website, an email. So if you were to, in using your binoculars or a telescope to see one that is tacked, we see them every once in a while in our grove. Then you, you call in, you say, hey, I saw this number, this, this color tag monarch, and you give them your location. And um, so as you can see, research can be sort of slow. There was one study, I might get to in this second later with something else, um, but they, um, yeah, it was up in Oregon. They, some prisoners actually helped with the study and they um, reared monarchs inside the prison, tagged them, thousands of them. And they were really only able to track around 60 of those that were tagged. And I believe they tagged around 15,000. It was a, no, maybe not that much. It was, a, it was many monarchs. And so they only found 60 of the tags, um, but they were able to learn some things from that. All to say, research is slow. And so um, their migration, Patterns, it's part of the mystery. So Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove is an overwintering site. Um, so when I say that, um, they are here, they come here to rest. We see, um, we see the Western population. So us over here, we get the, oh, it's already marked. We see the Western um, population. And it's the Rocky Mountains that are, are dividing two populations, the Western and the Eastern. Um, so all you all, the, I think I got one question. Oh, Florida. Yeah, so you all are seeing the Eastern monarch population. Um, genetically, they are the same. Um, so they will, um, they can definitely um, intermingle the other same. Um, now I'm gonna also be using the word historically at certain points. Um, we do have new research um, that's pretty fresh and it's has sort of mixed up all of our prior knowledge 
which is great. We love new research and new findings. Um, so historically, the Rocky Mountains have been this dividing factor. They are 14,000 feet in elevation. So it was thought that the monarchs couldn't make it over. Um, there are some areas where they do cross over the Rocky Mountains um, that we're learning. And um, historically, we always taught that the monarchs we see in our grove are coming um, from Canada and the Pacific Northwest. So Oregon and Washington. And that's what we taught. Those areas only. Um, new research, as you can see by these orange arrows, um, we're seeing monarchs from Arizona. We're seeing monarchs from Utah, Idaho, um, Nevada. So that is our new research. And so we're trying to wrap, just as educators, I'm not a scientist, as an educator, I'm trying to wrap my head around um, how to teach how to teach this new content because it's, it's very different from, from what we were teaching. Um, so let me take this off. So why did they even come here? So as you can, well, I'll say historically, just speaking about Canada and their winters, below freezing winters, our monarchs cannot survive below freezing, freezing or below freezing temperatures. Um, and that is why they migrate in the first place. Our Western population our overwintering sites in California are as about as south as they'll get. And they are here, they're here. So the Eastern population, those are the monarchs that funnel down to Mexico. Now, new research is showing that some Western population of the monarchs um, do go down to Mexico. Not many, but some. Um, but historically, we're as so south as they'll get are the overwintering sites in California. Um, so it's like they're sort of on a winter vacation with us. They're here for the warmth. They're here to survive. Um, uh, so the kids always like to, when I teach the kids, I always say they're on vacation here in California. Um, so they spend the month of November, historically November to February with us here. And it's a treat. It's beautiful. We had such low numbers. Um, this year, but it was still so beautiful. So if you get a chance to come visit us, please do. I don't know what next season will hold, um, but it's, yeah, it's amazing. Now let's see. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about their flight. So, and just these monarchs in general, the monarchs we see here, the migrating population are what we call the super generation of monarch butterflies. And here is mystery number one that I love teaching on. Um, you might see a bride, bride's gonna walk by behind me. <laughs> Must be a beach wedding. Um, our super generation. So these eggs that are hatched up in Canada and the Pacific Northwest in the late spring and early summer are genetically different um, than other generations. These eggs live a lot longer the super generation lives between six to eight months versus a, um, a regular generation that lives one month. So they live much longer and their bodies are able to store more fat. They have a larger fat reserve. So somehow um, the eggs that are laid during that time are just magically genetically different. They live longer and they store more fat. And that is to make the migration down to us. So they come down. Um, one study, one research found, researcher found out that um, they are capable of traveling 40 miles a day. Um, and for such a delicate butterfly, they do so by riding the warm air thermals that are about a thousand feet up in the sky. Um, and that allows them to travel much further without flapping their wings as much. Um, in the evening, they will descend from these thermals. They will nectar from flowers. And then in the morning, they will nectar once more and they'll rise and get back up in those warm air thermals to continue their journey down south. Um, so that is a little bit about, about their migration. Um, that is a little bit about how they get down to us. When they're in the grove, they are resting. They're here to rest. They rest in clusters. I will throw up some photos of that. Um, they nectar a little bit to keep their energy up um, and they will drink dew. 
<laughs> so that's about it for those months. Now, historically, warming temperatures in February will trigger them to start mating. Now, I say historically because we have been experiencing um, different weather patterns. So it's been much warmer, much earlier here. Um, this past season, I saw mating happening like late October, early November. So, um, and that's concerning because once they, once they mate, um, that sort of triggers the females to leave our grove in search of milkweed. And we'll get to why they're looking for milkweed. Um, but if they're mating so early in the season, milkweed isn't growing yet. So it sort of just becomes a problem. They, um, their life cycle migration, they rely on environmental cues. So fluctuating weather patterns and changes um, warming temperatures just really messes with their life cycle. So, but historically, early February, they'll start mating. Um, it used to be around the time of Valentine's Day. Um, so our docents, when they would give programs in here and they would sort of joke about that, the, they start mating around Valentine's Day. Um, the males die at that point because they're at the end of their life cycle. Females are at the end of their life cycle as well. However, they leave our grove start heading back up north in search of milkweed to lay their eggs. So um, I'll pause on that and I'll pull up some life cycle photos because we're jumping into the life cycle now. So milkweed, I'm just gonna get all of our photos we need. Um, I'm gonna go through some photos once I finished life cycle, if you would like me to put up another photo that I went, or a photo that I went through to look at it again, please tell me um, and I'll, I'll pull back up so we can look at it more. So here is milkweed. Our females leaving the grove are looking for it. It's very important. It is the absolute only plant our females will lay their eggs on. Now, these females will have upwards of 300 sometimes even 500 eggs in their abdomen at one time. Um, and they will only lay one egg per milkweed plant. They're smart in doing so. Uh, one caterpillar will eat a whole milkweed plant. So if she were to lay more than one egg on this plant, um, both caterpillars or however many eggs hatch, um, they wouldn't be able to survive. The other caterpillars would have to leave the plant and look for more milkweed. So one egg per milkweed plant. She is going to, sorry, that photo is so tiny. She's gonna lay on the underside of the leaf. This is um, an egg up close. You can see they're uh, sort of blurry, it's very blurry, but they're iridescent, they have ridges on it. Um, they're actually really pretty. They are about the size of head of a pin. Um, this shows that she's laying it on the underside of a leaf, and that is for protection, um, to give it a little bit more protection so predators can't see it as easily. So there it is. I like this photo because you can tell the size um, in comparison to, to the finger. In two to three days, the egg will hatch, um, and out comes our little monarch caterpillar larva. You can see it's white, it has a black head. Now, just like the hungry, hungry caterpillar, our caterpillar is hungry as it comes out. And the first thing it's going to eat is the egg shell for two reasons. One, for nutrients, and two, um, for protection. So uh, I always tell the kids, if I was a hungry bird and I saw an empty egg shell, I would know to go look for the caterpillar. So when the caterpillar eats the egg shell, it just offers a little bit more of a buffer. It eats it, it crawls away. No one's gonna know it was there. <laughs> One interesting thing in this photo, you can tell um, that this leaf has um, sort of like a fuzzy, fuzzy exterior. At this point, the larva's mouth is too small to start fully munching on the leaf. So it starts out by just eating the fuzz, the fuzz on top there. Um, now I mentioned the milkweed is the only plant the females lay their eggs on. Um, it is the only plant the caterpillar eats. 
And that is because um, they need, milkweed is poisonous and they store those toxins inside of their body as a defense mechanism, as um, a way to uh, ward off predators. So here is our growing caterpillar still eating milkweed. This is narrow leaf milkweed. Um, and they eat a lot. As you can tell, it's grown a lot. Its legs are much bigger. It has antennae on the head and the back. Um, the back are like faux to, um, to uh, fool predators. And look at those stripes. So bright colors out in nature are typically a warning sign. Danger, warning, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. So true to its colors, um, it is, like I mentioned, storing the um, poison from the milkweed inside its body. And those poisons are called cardenolites. Um, so growing even more, um, throughout its two weeks as a caterpillar, um, it will grow 2,700 times its original size as that little larva that we saw. Uh, so this next slide, slide I use with the kids, that is the equivalent of a newborn human baby growing to the size of a great big blue whale in just two weeks time. Um, so that's a lot of growing. The caterpillar's exoskeleton does not grow with it. So it does shed its skin. I don't know if anyone knew that caterpillar shed their skin. They do. Um, it'll shed its skin four different times. Um, they're called instars. They're actually five instars, but it, at this point, um, it's going to shed its skin four times. The last time it sheds its skin, that fifth instar, um, I'll show in, in, a, in a bit. But just like its eggshell, it is going to eat its skin. It just shed for the same two reasons, nutrients and protection. Okay, so it's been two weeks. Our caterpillar is ready to do its special um, chrysalis forming. It finds a sturdy twigger branch and it's going to hang down in what scientists call a J hook because it looks like the letter J. Now it has, the caterpillar has a structure for spinning silk um, below its mouth. So as that little arrow points to, it spins a silk button. It hangs down head first um, and there's a structure sort of similar to Velcro um, at the end, at the opposite end of its body called the cremaster. So it hooks it, the little tiny cremaster hooks into the silk button and hangs down. Now it's gonna shed its skin for one last time, the fifth time. This photo is incredible. You can see the skin, basically the uh, black stripes are just peeling off of it. Um, this photo is also, you can get a good glimpse of that silk button um, at the top here. Pretty amazing. And we can see down here, the chrysalis starting to form. Oops. And here it is. So this is the monarch butterfly, butterfly chrysalis. You can still see that silk button. And it is, these are beautiful to see in person. They look pretty in the picture, but in person, they are just gorgeous. Um, that beautiful jade green color. And those are gold flecks. Um, they are shimmery. Uh, and that comes from its diet from, of milkweed. So any milkweed eating butterfly caterpillar, the chrysalis will um, have these metallic aspects. One study I was reading, and I've only read one study, good rule of thumb, you got to find two other sources, right? Um, but this one study, the scientist was um, sort of wondering about, about these metallic uh, aspects. And um, the study was saying that possibly, just like, this is a tie, tie to farming, but just like um, farmers would tie those metallic strips to, um, to crops, the rows of crops, like here in California, our, our grape crops, I'll see those metallic um, strips of, of, of plastic to scare birds. Um, same thing with these metallic flecks here. Um, when they catch the light, um, this one scientist was thinking like maybe that would um, help to um, keep birds away. 
I just thought that was very interesting. One comment I get a lot is that this is a cocoon. Um, moths form cocoons that are made out of silk. Butterflies make a chrysalis and it's made out of the same material as our fingernails. So much, much more sturdy. Now, okay, so time in the chrysalis, it's gonna be about two weeks. One very interesting thing is, um, so first of all, process of metamorphosis, right? So what's happening is the caterpillar parts are basically dissolving into uh, a living soup, if you will, and rearranging to form the butterfly parts. Um, but the interesting thing is the whole metamorphosis process does not solely occur in the two weeks in the chrysalis. Um, because even as in the larval state, um, it was found, scientists found out that um, they actually have cells for their wings located behind their, their heads already sort of there. Um, I just find that fascinating. So in two weeks time, oh, here's another picture of the chrysalis. How beautiful. Oh gosh. I'm missing some photos. I apologize. In two weeks time though, um, the chrysalis will actually darken. So if you've ever seen that, uh, it's pretty cool. Perfect, here we go. So it darkens and then it turns clear. So when a chrysalis is clear, um, keep watching because soon you know it's gonna come out. And it is just so cool how you can see the wings inside. I, at least I think it's cool. So here it comes out. It has what we say, um, the scientific word is eclose. It has eclose from the chrysalis. It has come out, um, but it's wings. It cannot fly at this point. It's wings are still damp. Um, what happens is, and you can't see it from this angle, but at this point, the monarch's abdomen has a lot of fluid inside of it. So it pumps the fluid through the veins in its wings, and that helps to unfold the wings, and then it dries out in the sun. Here's an empty chrysalis. And it's all ready to fly. So... <laughs> That was a lot, and I know it's a lot. So um, let's pause for questions. If you have a question, would you please raise your hand, electronic hand? Are there any questions at this time? If you think of any, as I can, oh, do you have one? Debbie Hansen, a question? Yes, yeah, so all of that crystallis is gonna hang on the butterfly, on the milkweed plant? That, that doesn't need to be on a milkweed, no. Okay. Those can be located anywhere. Good question, yeah. Because at that point, uh, it's done with milkweed. <laughs> that you. milkweed is important for the egg stage and the, ca the caterpillar stage. Okay. Thank you. Eileen Rhodes? Hi, um, I might be jumping ahead, but I'm wondering what is the hope for the future of the monarch? We hear so yeah. many things and it's, yeah, it's rather know. concerning. It is concerning, yeah, especially being an educator in a grove. I mean, it's part of my job, yes. so if they stop coming here, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I won't get to teach on them anymore. Um, so yeah, we will totally get to that. I have graphs, I have charts, I got it all. Um, so once we get to that point, I will definitely um, pause more. Um, and so if you have specific questions, please ask me. Thank you. Francis Edwards, please. And Francis, you are muted. I live in San Luis Obispo. And oh. I wonder, <laughs> yeah, I wonder I you. When, when you should plant your uh, milkweed for the butterflies. Um, that's a great question. I'll touch on milkweed later, but for right now, first of all, um, make sure it's a native species. Um, oh gosh, let me think. 
like springtime. Um, so native for us here would be narrow leaf, milkweed, showy milkweed, or woolly. Um, make sure it's not tropical. If you do have tropical, um, it's just very, very important to cut it way down in winter. Um, and I'll probably touch on this again, um, but that is to um, cut back on a certain parasite that forms um, that's like detrimental to the monarch. So um, does that answer your question? When? Springtime. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, let me check my notes and while I'm pulling up more photos if there's any other questions either raise your hand or write it down we'll, we'll totally get to it um what do we want to start with okay we'll just dive into the de decline a little population decline why are we seeing so few so the um, photo of the smaller cluster, I mentioned clusters, here they are. Um, I'll talk about this actually. Uh, you know what, let me talk about clusters and we'll get to decline. These clusters, while they're in our grove, a lot of people come in and they say, they come in in the winter time and they say, where are they? I don't see them. They cluster high up in our eucalyptus trees. Um, monarch butterflies can only fly if they are 55 degrees or warmer. So if it's cooler than 55 degrees, they are in their clusters um, with their wings closed. Um, once sunlight starts to warm their wings, you'll see these clusters, um, like in this photo here, um, the wings will start to open. And it, um, if you're lucky enough to see this, what happens is a thing called bursting. We call it bursting when they sort of all warm up at the same time and they just all take off of the branch at the same time. It is really, really cool. I've only seen it a couple of times. Um, so also they cluster for um, protection from wind and rain and a little bit for warmth. Um, so that is kind of clustering. Um, but as you can see, okay, so the photo on the left is one of the only clusters we saw this last season. So the 2021 season. Now, in that cluster, there are about 80 monarchs. Total last season, we saw around 200. Um, and that was pretty on par for the other larger overwintering sites in California. Um, the photo on the right was taken only five years ago. In this photo, there are hundreds of monarch butterflies in this single cluster. So about five years ago, we saw 20,000 monarch butterflies in this growth. So in the um, eight, 1980s, um, there were many monarchs. This little chart sort of helps us. Um, so just reading it to give you an idea of what the decline in the overwintering population since the 80s looks like for every 2,250 monarchs there were then, there's only one left today. So this graph here is, is great. Um, in the early 90s, our grove, just our grove was seeing around 175,000 monarch butterflies a season. <laughs> just our grove alone. Um, and you can see major fluctuations. Um, but now we, um, so to just to get last season to get 200, um, last, last season, we saw around 7,000, um, uh, which was up from 4,000 the year prior to that. So I was hopeful for the last, for this last season after seeing 7,000, um, but we saw 200 and we were pretty lucky to see 200. Let me stop sharing these. Um, so yeah, that is startling, right? <laughs> Let me just, there are reasons for this. I'll get to those right now. Okay. So these are, there are a handful, these are a few, um, lots of habitat. 
So lots of overwintering site. Um, yeah, um, that is due to many factors. <laughs> Just trees being taken out for urbanization. Um, California, if you don't already know, um, yeah, we don't get much rain at least in the areas um, where our groves are. So we are just in a constant drought. And um, majority of our groves in California consist primarily of eucalyptus trees. Their roots are pretty shallow. So in drought, um, that just makes it worse and um, they just fall over. So we're so lucky to um, have this grove be on state park property because we can manage it. Um, we just planted a lot more eucalyptus trees and Monterey cypress trees in this grove. Sort of controversial to plant a non-native species, but the eucalyptus trees, and I didn't touch on this, but the eucalypt eucalyptus trees just make the perfect habitat for them here. So their height, the huge canopy of leaves offer great protection from wind and rain. Uh, so we planted more, even though it's a non-native species. Uh, so yeah, we can protect this grove which is probably the reason why it's, it's one of the largest in California now. Um, and fires. If you haven't heard that on the news, gosh, um, yeah, we just have massive fires. Our fire season just keeps getting worse and longer. Um, and it's taking out land, not only overwintering sites, but it's taking out key habitat in their migrating corridors. So as they fly down, these fires, first of all, are so massive. There's so much smoke in the air. That's right during the time our monarchs are making their way down to us. Um, so of course the smoke is affecting them. Fires are taking out um, like areas where they nectar. So it, it's causing them to change their um, migration patterns, which is a massive thing. If they're, if they're used to going a certain way every year, um, they're adaptable. They'll find new ways. They'll find new groves to overwinter. Um, but it's, it's definitely hurting their numbers. Pesticides or just pollution in general. Um, excess picked up by wind is affecting plants um, used for nectaring and it's also affecting milkweed. We just learned how incredibly important milkweed is to their life cycle. The only plant they lay their eggs on, the only plant the caterpillars eat. Um, so yeah, I'm not an expert in farming. I know pesticides are are um, very important to certain crops, um, uh, but it can't be looked past that. Um, you know, that does affect uh, good plants and it does affect um, insects uh, and changes in weather. So warmer weather patterns, like I mentioned with the whole mating in our grove, um, warmer, warmer weather patterns have an effect um, on their envir environmental cues. So they're leaving our grove early. I mentioned this before milkweed season. So yeah, just like little fluctuations can actually have a, a, a drastic impact on the monarch um, or all insects in general. Monarchs are just such a high profile insect. We can use them as a great teaching tool um, to bring awareness of, uh, for all insects. Same, same with honeybees. So call to action, um, what can we do to help? Um, we'll, get to, we'll get to milkweed. I also wanna talk about, um, and um, yeah, when I had a, my test call with some of you on, gosh, what day was that? Was that Thursday? Um, yes. We did chat about native species to Texas. So, I did a little research. I'll pull up my um, my chart on that. Sorry, and Michelle. Pause. There is a question while you're looking up that. Oh, what? Yes, while well, I'm looking for a, a certain a certain yes. slide. Absolutely. The question is: Does monarch farming occur for research purposes? Have Western been transported to the east, and vice versa, to determine if insect behavior will kick in? And that I from that's a great question. I um, have not heard anything about Eastern just sort of being caught and released over here. Um, that is something I should look into when I get back to my office. Um, I just, I, I try to stay on top of things. I haven't heard about that. Um, I will look into it. Um, 
one thing though I can talk about is I am just missing my slide before I lose my train of thought. Oh, here we go. Let me pull these up. Um, one thing that's happening um, that seems like a good thing, um, but really isn't, is actually um, raising them inside of homes. So a lot of local people and a lot of people around around the nation, um, even in, in children's classrooms, they do raise them. However, um, this is creating populations that are actually smaller in size when they're raised inside a house or in, you know, not out in the wild. They're smaller in size. And like I just said, they're just not wild. And so when they're let up out uh, after being raised inside a house, um, they're just not well equipped. And that creates populations that are non-migratory. So it's actually having a negative effect. Um, but they're such a great learning tool for classrooms. It's hard to even talk about this or it's so cool to raise them inside your house. Um, and I love how excited people are in trying to help monarchs by raising them in their house, but it's really having a negative effect. Um, so back to helping them. Um, so yeah, planting milkweed, so important, um, but it must be a native species to your area and planted 10 miles from any overwintering site. And that is because milkweed isn't part of their life cycle in, in an overwintering site. Like we learned, they're here to rest. And then at the end of their um, resting, they mate and leave the grove. They're not interested in milkweed. They're not laying eggs here. Um, it's just, we need it planted further away to, to help them um, just maintain their, um, their regular life cycle. Um, a great thing to do other than milkweed is just to plant nectaring flowers. Um, so turn your garden into a butterfly way station. Way station is just a stopping point. So I mentioned how they need fuel, they nectar when they come down from those warm air thermals, they refuel and they continue their migration. So um, if you're, yeah, just, just plant flowers for nectar. And that honestly helps all insects. Um, little birdie told me that someone's going to be speaking about honeybees soon. Um, so you'll probably hear about that same thing for the honeybees as well. Um, and just reducing pollut pollutants. Um, pollutants can harm food sources and the insects themselves. Um, one study I looked into a couple days ago before talking to y'all, um, was, it's actually on bees in India. So India, urban areas, lots of pollutants. Um, and so just speaking about bees, I'm not sure exactly if this transfers over to monarch or to butterflies, but the bees um, studied, the, their heart rate um, quickened. It was super rapid. Um, it's actually, we had a video of the heartbeat. It was, it was crazy to look at. And um, the excess pollutants, compromise their immune system. So it's just like, just not good for insects. So um, that is, let's see. Oh, wait, here, native milkweed. So here in my area in California, like I mentioned, got showy milkweed is a great one to plant or narrow leaf milkweed. Texas did my, did my research. Um, and just at the top of my side here, you can read over 100 species of milkweed 30 of those 100 are native to Texas. So um, the ones I have listed here are central Texas. We'll get to why I listed those. So we have green milkweed and antelope horns. Um, I should include some photos of these, but look them up. They're, they're pretty, they're cool. Um, and these two species of milkweed are prevalent in the central flyway. And here is the central flyway of the monarchs through Texas. Um, so they traveled down, let me get my marker out. They are coming down to reach Mexico through here. Um, after the overwinter, um, females will start to leave. I'm not sure exactly, I teach all, clearly I teach more of the Western population versus the Eastern. Um, but um, after overwintering, they fly up this way and up this way. So this area here, beautiful spot to um, plant those uh, milkweed and nectaring flowers. So I'm gonna pause here. Questions? 
please raise your electronic hand if you have questions. Yes, Vicki Carmichael. Does providing water for them do any good? Because I have seen other types of butterflies at my uh, bird bath. Yeah, so they do drink. Um, one reason I didn't go to the whole spiel of why this is the perfect habitat for them, this grove in particular, um, but one of those factors besides the canopy the eucalyptus trees make um, is the proximity to the ocean. So we get that morning dew in here, that the dew will, will um, just that condensation, our butterflies drink that while they're here. So um, yeah, I, I know like while they're flying, I'm sure they can fly, find um, water sources. Um, so sure, yeah, if you have like a bird bath in your yard, I'm sure they'll stop if, if they need some water and, and get some, um, but just even do on plants, they'll go for as well. Thank you, Michelle. Any other questions? Michelle, this has been a fascinating, fascinating program. You know, it is just my favorite thing. And um, now I've been, oh, sorry for the sirens. Um, yeah, so this is a winter topic for me. So getting back to it during summer has just been a treat. Um, and yeah, a lot of research is, is being conducted now. Um, so I'm very eager to, to study more. Um, and if you guys ever want to chat with me again, I might have some new information for you. And just, um, if we chat, if we do the zoom again in the winter, um, I can be live for you guys to see, see what the population is doing this coming season. It'd be very interesting. Perfect. But stay on Michelle. We're going to have Glenn yes. Martin. He always does a toast. So Glenn, our official Toastmaster, is going to toast you to you. And then we're going to acknowledge some more of the national officers. So over to you, Mr. Martin. Michelle, first, um, I had a question. She just couldn't see my, my hand was up. Can you um, talk a little bit about the role of monarchs in human agriculture? OK, yeah. So um, let me pull up. I knew I was going to forget about that. Um, I did have a slide on, yes. So. Monarchs as pollinators. Um, they are a pollinator. Um, so they do play a role not as large as bees. Um, and that is due to their long legs. So if you can picture a monarch sort of landing on a plant or flower, they are raised more than a bee would be. Um, therefore, they don't, they can't, they won't necessarily get pollen like on their bodies. They lack structures for um, collecting pollen. So um, if you do have that presentation on honeybees, um, you'll learn that bees have a comb-like structure on their back legs. So when they get pollen on the, the buzz of their body, um, they essentially like comb it down with their back legs. And then um, they sort of combine it with some saliva and that gets, um, they have a little ridge on their back legs as well. And they store that hardened pollen um, in those ridges on their back legs. Monarchs are lacking those um, structures. Um, so, but they do different than bees. Um, they have great vision. They don't have the best sense of smell, but they have great vision. They can see colors, they can see red, bees cannot. And so um, they are attracted to brighter colors. Um, so they have a role in pollination. Is it the largest? No. So I don't know if that answers your question, um, but that's, yeah, that's, Pretty much all I know about their role um, as far as like farming. Any additional questions, Glenn? No, sir. That's okay. That answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. And then I will turn it over to you, Glenn, for your phenomenal toast. Sorry, uh, we're having some computer problems there. Hang on one sec. And you just muted yourself again. 
Okay, there we go. <clears throat> On behalf of the officers and members of the National Society, Descendants of American Farmers, I want to thank Michelle for joining us today and reminding us of the vitally important role that monarch butterflies serve in our very fragile ecosystem. This is particularly important as the drought conditions in California will have a very negative effect on the availability of milkweed and nectar product providing plants, further endangering the monarch's life cycle. Members, please join me as we wish Michelle continued good health and good fortune in her future efforts to educate the public about the key role of monarch butterflies in both nature and agriculture. Cheers. 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 Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. If everyone would like to stay on, we're going to have a few other things. I'd like to acknowledge the additional uh, national officers that are here, please. And then I would like to, Sue, would you like to say anything right now? Would you like to? Would I like to? I would like to say I'd like to get on the road. <laughs> okay. um, I. Uh, I would like to say, just as a reminder, um, once again, um, new members, 13 new members equals one scholarship and 40 supplementals equals one scholarship. So it is important that we go out there and get those members and do our uh, part to help our scholarship fund, um, since that is one of our main um, projects that we support. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Safe travels, Sue. She's leaving on vacation right now. Yep, I am. Yes. Bye, Sue. Talk later. All Bye. right. So now that the rest of you that are on, I know that we have some officers, national officers that I did not call on. So Bill Ritchie, if you would please bring greetings real quick, please. Well, I'm from the District of Columbia, so I guess uh, that's also considered a pseudo state, but um, uh, I always enjoy uh, networking with uh, my fellow descendants of the American farmers. Um, and um, uh, I've been very busy with uh, um, DC SAR type of uh, you know, activities, uh, 4th of July, we recognize members, uh, the entire Metropolitan Police Department, the entire United States Capitol Police, and a couple of the officers um, that were in the melee on uh, uh, January 6th. And that was especially rewarding to me as I am a retired uh, Deputy Chief of Police with uh, Metropolitan Police. So. Uh, so once again, uh, greetings to everyone. I enjoyed uh, learning about the Monarch. So. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. I know we have some other national officers. I, I called on Joe. The Rosalind Grunfield, you are an officer. Yes, um, thank you. I would like to first thank Michelle. I found that fascinating. I don't know if those lovely monarchs ever come to Wyoming where I am, but um, I might try to plant some milkweed and something and see what happens. But thank you for that. And Madam President, would it be all right if I mentioned tomorrow's presentation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I hope y'all all will be able to attend our presentation tomorrow on Wyoming ranchers. Um, Shelly Trumbull and her daughter, Kristen, run a cattle ranch here in Casper, Wyoming, that has been in Shelley's family um, for 100, over 100 years. So please tune in. You will be, again, um, fascinated with that presentation and learn so much. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Helen Werner, please, ma'am. Michelle, you are welcome to stay with us as long as you would like, or you may leave whenever you want, but thank you, you may stay. Helen Werner, please. Yes, thank you. thank you, Michelle. We appreciate the presentation. Everybody loves to see monarchs, no matter what the condition, and we appreciate it, and I'm representing a Continental Society Daughters of Indian Wars. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Gabby Hadika, would you like to bring greetings, ma'am? I'm sorry, did you call me? I did, yes, ma'am. I said, would you like to bring greetings? 
Oh, yes, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm sitting here with my grandson who was watching the monarchs because he loves butterflies. So I keep putting myself on mute because he's keeping me very busy. So I bring greetings as a past national president of Southern Dames of America. I, this is just a wonderful thing to see and monarchs run through my neighborhood all the time back here in Corpus Christi. So this was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, Candy Bassett, would you like to bring greetings? Thank you, Madam President. National, it's an honor to be here as Chaplain National, and I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. I didn't know how little I, I didn't know. <laughs> anyway, we learned a lot today, and I, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, President National. Thank you, Sandy, and I'll be coming back to you in a few moments also. I want to make certain that I have not missed any national officer in the group. So if I have missed you, uh, Linda Mizell, I did miss you, ma'am. Are you still on? And I missed Nancy Gilfillan. So Nancy, please. First of all, Madam President National, first of all, Michelle, I love the program. I learned a great deal and I, and I thank you very much for it. I'm the uh, National Organizing Director for uh, Farmers. Thank you very much, Nancy, and an excellent one. Thank you. Have I missed anyone, please? All right, uh, Vicki Zvernik, may I say congratulations? Vicki, would you- Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> so Vicki was just honored a few days ago. Would you like to, may, is it possible that you could please tell why? Oh, uh, I was elected Honorary Vice President General for Life for DAR. Congratulations. Thank nice. you so much. I'm very pleased for you. Very pleased. Well, Susan Davis, do you have your hand up, ma'am? I was just congratulating Vicki. <laughs> Thank you. We all send uh, lots of congratulations for you. Even every one of you are so important to our society to us uh, for everything that you do and everything that you, all the new people that you touch. And I do want to acknowledge my parliamentary national, Martha Hilton. Uh, she is uh, phenomenal for us. Martha, do you want to bring greetings? On behalf of the Maryland membership, as I am their ambassador and also have the pleasure of serving as the national parliamentarian, Mackenzie the cat, who is always in my lap for every Zoom I've ever attended. We bring you up. greetings and we hope you stay cool wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Parliamentary right. National. Doris, uh, would you like to bring greetings, ma'am? And she is muted. Oops. She's still muted. Well, I was. Did did that do it? That did it. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I've enjoyed the program. Thank you so much for having this. Yeah, you're welcome, Doris. All right. If there's anyone else that would like to bring greetings, like to say hello, please raise your electronic hand. Otherwise, I'm going to ask Sandy. Oh, Davina, would you please bring the numbers? The numbers, yes, please. Happy Davina. to. We now have 1,182 members. Fabulous. And on our supplements, we have 1,159. Phenomenal. Thank you, yes, everyone, yes. for all, Very good. That, Very good. all the hard work. And Sandy, may I turn it over to you, please? Or, oh, Glenn, do you have your hand up again, sir? Yes, sir. Oh, I just wanted to say it's good to see everyone. I hadn't, it'd been a while since we had a meeting and uh, missed everyone. Uh, and I uh, was just really looking forward to this, not just to show off my awesome background, but uh, because it's such a great society and uh, everyone is so involved and gets great speakers like Michelle and um, our older daughter goes to slow. So um, we'll definitely be sending her out there to check out the Monarchs if she hasn't already. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. And I want to uh, tell everyone, if you look at Glenn's background, I presented Glenn 
a few weeks ago with the President National Award for all that he does for this society. And so help me congratulate him. We did it on a Zoom, just a few of us, but congratulations again, when we appreciate you immensely. You are a major important part of this society. Well, I'll tell everyone, like I told you, I didn't feel, certainly didn't feel worthy of it compared to the hard work that so many other members uh, do in the society that, that just make it work. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, the, being a Toastmaster is a, is a privilege. It's certainly not a chore at all. And I know that many, many of you women and, and probably men as well, uh, uh, just work so hard to make the society what it is. And I, I just really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm proud to wear the medal and I'm proud to be, um, associated with the others who do and everything they do for us. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Donna, you have your hand up, ma'am. I do. I have a question for Michelle. My, we had a lightning storm right in the middle of everything. So I lost about 15 minutes of the program. Is Pacific Grove, um, is it also having the decline that you're having? Absolutely. Yeah. So they pretty much had the same number as we did. Um, number of monarchs. So it's the whole Western population. Eastern population is actually actually on a slight decline as well. We're just not seeing it like we are with the Western population. So it's all, yeah, it's it's everywhere. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna um yeah. I just want to take a second before I leave. Um just to thank you so so much for having me um speak to you. Honestly is more of an honor and pleasure. Um, for me to talk to you then maybe for you guys to listen to me um and i also want to thank just everyone's background here just um hearing you introduce yourself and what you represent is really cool um and also just to thank all of y'all who are um you know part of our far farming family half farmed our farming um thank you for all of that hard work because you feed us all. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say that as I sign off today um, and please reach out to me again. <laughs> it was, I had just had a blast with y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We'll touch back with you. We have a certificate appreciation uh, for you and Sue Fitzpatrick will be bringing that to you in the next few weeks when she returns. Oh, that's so great. Well, thank you and um, see you next time. <laughs> all right, bye. Bye, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Thank bye. you, Michelle. Bye-bye. And Sandy, are you still on? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I am. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you. And I thank everyone again for participating. I look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow. And one last thing, don't forget July the 17th is our Sharing Our Societies. You are going to be amazed at the 24 societies that will be represented and will be talking to you. You, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we close this meeting this day, we ask thy blessing about each of us. Watch over us and keep us safe from harm. Please bless us in the work which we are committed to do for our beloved society. And may we continue to be faithful to our obligation. Sir. And may the peace of God abide in our hearts now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone. And LJ Mack, I'd like to say hello. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a, a new member uh, from California. So I see that you're new, but uh, it's good to see your name there. And thank you again. Until we uh, see again, former hugs, former hugs to each and every one of you. Bye. Thank you. Great meeting.